Um, William Stafford Noble is the uh, the keynote for today. Um, Bill, he basically, you know, they, they have your, your background history from when you grew up in Naperville, Illinois, to uh, all the way through. So, um, some cool highlights, which I think um, Bill did between undergraduate and graduate, is he was at the SRI um, International Institute, Entropic Research Lab, and actually spent some time in the Peace Corps, which I think is is pretty cool. Um, he went and did his PhD at the University of California, uh, San Diego with Charles Elkin, um, spent some time in the Hausler lab, and then went on to be a, uh, an assistant professor in the Department of Computer Science uh, at Columbia University. Um, in 2002, he joined the faculty at the University of Washington. He's uh, in the departments of the genome sciences. Um, you also have adjunct in computer science engineering. Um, his research really focuses on um, applying statistical and machine learning techniques for modeling and understanding the biological processes at the molecular level. Uh, Bill Nobles also has an NSF Career Award and is also a Sloan Research Fellow. And with that, I will let Bill talk about his research. All right, thank you very much for sticking around till the end of the day. <clears throat> um, as the title implies, I'm going to talk about uh, three-dimensional genome architecture. And uh, the beginning of the um, talk is going to be a little bit of background that those of you who are in this room this afternoon might have seen already. But for those who are in the other room, I need to go over some of it again. Um, so I first, hopefully this is becoming more clear to people, but I find there are still people who aren't really clear on why we care about the three-dimensional conformation of DNA in the cell. I mean, you have two meters of DNA uh, crammed into six microns of a nucleus in your cells. Um, which is sort of the equivalent of having a, a, a thread that's four miles long and trying to crush it into a sphere the size of a penny, right? So it's, a, it's pretty compacted in there. And the question is, why do we care about how, in, in what fashion it's, you know, what it looks like when it's compacted? And the answer really is that there are important functional processes that are, imp uh, that are um, influenced by the three-dimensional co conformation of DNA in the nucleus. So, we know, for example, that it's related to gene expression, and I'll talk about some ways in which that's true, but certainly promoter enhancer contacts um, are uh, important in 3D, and then there are also larger scale uh, phenomena. It's also intimately involved in DNA replication, and there's increasing evidence of the link between 3D conformation and DNA replication, and there are undoubtedly other functional processes as well. So, there's been a lot of interest in this field in general. They just had at the NIH uh, three weeks ago the kickoff of this new uh, 4D nucleome initiative in which they funded 29 different research groups uh, to do different studies related to the three-dimensional conformation of DNA. And a lot of this interest, uh, not all of it, but some of this interest is driven by technology. Uh, and in particular, this very influential paper from Science in 2009 from Lieberman Aiden et al. described this high C assay, which has been described uh, several times earlier, but let me just make sure we're all on the same page. The basic idea is you want to try to understand the 3D conformation, and we're going to do that by measuring uh, pairs of contacts between different DNA loci. So you introduce formaldehyde crosslinks into the cell, and then you use a restriction enzyme to cleave the DNA. And the, the cleaved sites you fill in with biotin, which you're going to use later on, and then you re-ligate those ends and shear the DNA. And when you do your biotin pull-down, you're specifically enriching for fragments that look like this. They have sort of the orange on one side and the blue on the other, which means they came from different uh, parts of the genome. So the idea is that if you uh, map each of those ends separately to the genome, and they map to very different regions along the genomic uh, uh, along the chromosome, you can infer that in that particular cell, those two loci were close in 3D. So the primary output of this kind of assay is a contact map. So this is a, an example of a contact map from yeast. So there are 16 chromosomes arrayed along each of the axes. In this um, matrix, each uh, cell corresponds to uh, two 10 KB regions along the yeast chromosome. And uh, in its rawest form, the data is just integer counts. So it's essentially, you've got paired end reads, and your integer count associated with locus I and locus J is the number of, of paired end reads where one end mapped to I and one end mapped to J. <clears throat> so 
uh, there are lots of things that you can do with this assay, and not all of them were immediately obvious when it was first developed. So, for example, people have recently shown that if you're doing metagenomics and you want to figure out which reads are coming from which organism, you can use the HiC data to help you with that deconvolution task. Um, it's also used in a related task, which is if you, if you want to do scaffolding and phasing of a genome, the HiC can help you with that as well, because it's telling you which reads are coming from the same chromosome most of the time. Um, it's also what I'm going to talk about more is helpful for understanding the three-dimensional conformation of the genome and for also zooming in and helping you look for particular long-range chromatin contacts. So we got into this field back in 2010 when we published a related assay uh, that we had developed concurrently with hi C, and we used it to analyze the three-dimensional conformation of yeast. So this was the first really high-resolution picture of a, a eukaryotic genome. It's kind of hard to see in this light, but uh, what the picture is showing is each of the chromosomes of yeast in a three-dimensional model, and there are things like the, the clustering of centromeres that are apparent from, from this picture. Uh, but one of the things that quickly became obvious was that, at least in yeast, uh, the, the relationship between three-dimensional architecture and gene expression, although it's there, it's fairly tenuous. It's not a very strong relationship between the two in yeast. Um, so I wanted to tell you about an alternate story first where there's a, a more striking relationship, and that is in a different, um, a different organism, Plasmodium falciparum. This is the organism responsible for the most lethal form of malaria, and this is a collaboration with Karine LaRoche's lab um, and her postdoc, Eveline, and they're a Plasmodium lab, and also a collaboration with Jean-Philippe Veyer, who's a machine learning expert, and Nell Verico, a, a grad student in his lab. And most of the work uh, on the computational end was done by Ferhat A. when he was a postdoc with me. So, you may not know that much about plasmodium, um, so I'll, let me tell you a little bit. This is a, a parasite that has a very interesting life cycle. It has different phases of the life cycle when it occupies uh, the, both the mosquito and also human, and there are two phases in human when it's in the um, liver and when it's in the blood cells. Uh, and we're going to focus in particular on, uh, on the, the blood cell stage here. Um, <clears throat> one of the things that makes plasmodium uh, mysterious is that we don't really understand all the mechanisms by which it regulates its gene expression. One thing that's clear is that it doesn't have many transcription factors. You can look for DNA binding domains, and if you look at yeast, there's, you know, several hundred. And in plasmodium, there's on the order of 50 to 70 of these things. Um, it's also clear that over the erythrocytic cycle, which is this uh, cycle during the, the blood stage, uh, there are pretty significant changes in local chromatin conformation. So this is a study from Karin's lab where they used two complementary assays to measure chromatin conformation, FAIR and MAIN. These are measuring open chromatin and closed chromatin, respectively. Uh, and this is a schematic of the, of the cycle, the erythrocytic cycle, and the red and the gray are the, the opening and closing of the chromatin through that cycle. So uh, what we're interested in is understanding how the large-scale chromatin structure changes through the erythrocytic cycle and then trying to relate that back to things like gene expression. So uh, we assayed plasmodium in three different samples. These are uh, drawn uh, zero hours, 18 hours, and 36 hours after uh, infection. And we're interested in trying to understand at each of those stages what, or overall, what are the organizational principles. So we used a relatively straightforward multidimensional scaling technique to infer uh, the three-dimensional structure of the, of the plasmodium genome. Uh, at these three different stages. This is a little movie that just shows a, a linear interpolation between three independently inferred models. So what the, the nucleus in plasmodium starts out very compact and then gets bigger during about 18 hours after infection, and then it, com um, it uh, co gets compact again just before egress from the nucleus. Um, and a lot of the actual gene activity occurs during the middle of that stage when everything's opened up. One of the things you notice in that animation is that the colors, the, uh, which are the different chromosomes, stay fairly consistent even though the three models were inferred independently. So there are consistent chromosome territories throughout this process. The other thing that we can see if we look at the three different time points independently is some phenomena that, um, that leap out at us. So for example, these dots here correspond to the centromeres. And just like in yeast, you see strong centromere clustering in plasmodium. 
you probably, it's harder to see here, but uh, if we flip these over, there are white dots down here that are telomeres, and the telomeres also co-localize and at the opposite pole from the centromeres. Um, finally, there's an interesting class of genes in plasmodium called the virulence genes. There are 60 of these genes, and they are responsible for evading the human immune system. And it has this interesting um, expression modality where stochastically in every cell, one of these genes is expressed and 59 are repressed. Um, these genes tend to be lo located near the telomeres, but there are a subset of them that are located in clusters in the middle of the chromosomes. So each of these boxes will contain multiple virulence genes. If we look at the locations of those virulence genes, which are really visible on my screen and not very visible at all on this screen, you just, just have to trust me that these green dots here all uh, occur down in this region near the telomeres. And in particular, things like this, this is one of those clusters, which is in the middle of a chromosome and yet is being dragged down toward the telomeres. So these, these are highly co-localized and also on the telomeric end of the, uh, of the nucleus. One of the things that leaps out at you when you look at the data in a different way, when you look at it as a contact map, is that it has this interesting, these interesting patterns. It's most apparent here in the trophozoite stage. You see this kind of cross-like pattern here. That means that you have a, a section of the DNA that is interacting strongly with itself and not interacting much with the rest of the genome. It's kind of acting like a very small, uh, very cohesive domain. And it turns out that these uh, yellow boxes correspond to this internal cluster of, bar of virulence genes. So that implies that these genes not only are co-localizing, but they're not interacting with anyone else in the genome. So you see this across stages. You also see it on different chromosomes. So you can see some of these same bar patterns, and we showed that these are statistically significant um, across all the different internal VAR gene clusters. And then if you look at a chromosome that has none of these internal VAR gene clusters, you really don't see much of, a, of that same kind of pattern. So that's interesting, but we also wanted to quantify the relationship between gene expression and, and um, gene, uh, genome architecture. And so we did that a couple different ways. One of them is, is looking at things like this. this. This is just the normalized contact count. So it's been normalized using uh, one of these, a method called ICE. And this is, we've taken data from uh, four different previous studies and just looked at the correlation of expression of different pairs of, of all pairs of genes over this same erythrocytic uh, cell cycle. And uh, what you can see here is a strong relationship between the contact counts and the expression correlation. So as you get highly correlated uh, gene expression profiles, you also see that the genes are close in three dimensions. Uh, and conversely, you can do the same thing actually in the three-dimensional model, uh, and you get the, the opposite phenomenon because obviously uh, 3D distance is you know, closer, smaller is, is better in that setting. Um, and then finally, we said, how can we actually look at this um, uh, on a more global scale and we used a, a, a method called kernel canonical correlation analysis. So canonical correlation analysis is a way of, of relating data, for, uh, different types of data to each other. And if you use a kernel, you can do it with data that doesn't necessarily have a vector format to it. And so what this picture shows, admittedly not very well, uh, is the, a color scale that is supposed to be visible across the, the, um, the nucleus here. Each of these dots is a gene and it's colored by the KCCA uh, score, which is finding essentially the, uh, a, a single score that is smooth with respect to both the three-dimensional structure and with respect to the gene expression profiles. And what you see is if you look at genes that are strongly enriched for one end of this score range, you get things like antigenic variation and sexual stage genes. So antigenic variation, those are those virulence genes I told you about. Sexual stage genes are genes, this is the asexual part of the life cycle. So these are genes that are shut down during the erythrocytic cycle. Um, on the other end, you get things that are specifically involved in the trophozoite stage, which is that uh, 18 hours after the beginning of the erythrocytic cycle. So there's an organism where, unlike yeast, we really see a, a lot going on in terms of relating three-dimensional architecture to the gene expression. Um, now we're going to turn to a different project where we're, instead of looking at plasmodium, we're looking at the human genome, but we're taking a, um, we're taking a, a larger scale view. So this is work that was done in collaboration with a number of people, but most of the work was done by a, a great grad student in my lab, Max Liebrecht. So the question Max wanted to, to try to address was, 
if, how do we know, how does a particular gene know when it's supposed to be expressed? And really, uh, classically, there's been two different answers to this question. One of them is what we're probably most familiar with, which is this model of local regulation, that you have transcription factors that come down and bind to the DNA. Maybe they've got enhancers that are involved as well, uh, and that causes the gene to get turned on, more or less. Um, but this doesn't ex explain what in the literature is called position effect variegation, or variegation, I don't know how you say that word. Uh, but anyway, the idea is there are, there are examples, well-known examples of genes where you have exactly the same sequence, but if you put the gene down in a different part of the genome, it doesn't get turned on. So that nothing's changed locally, but there's something about its, its larger context that causing it to be shut down. And this has to do with domain scale regulation. So we know that there are large heterochromatic regions of the genome that are sort of called repressive compartments of the genome. And these are in contrast to parts of the genome that are active. Uh, and those have, you know, transcription factories and all the enhancers and all the activity going on. So this is sort of a larger scale phenomenon. What we noticed when we looked at the literature is that lots of people over the years have described different ways to sort of compartmentalize the genome into different domains. So you have, you know, constitutive heterochromatin and facultative heterochromatin, which are characterized by these different types of histone modifications. You have lamin-associated regions, which you can get lamin B1 data. You have open compartments and closed compartments from high c data, and also these topological domains from high c data. And sort of the question was, couldn't we come up with a single way to tr try to summarize what is the, top of the, the domain structure of the genome on the basis of many different types of data? Um, I, have, I admit we didn't sort of think of that question sort of out of the blue. It kind of related to an ongoing research project in the lab. So this is um, semi-automated genome annotations are, are, is our rebranding of what many of you may be familiar with as segmentation algorithms. Uh, these were developed by us and by Manolis Kellis as part of the ENCODE consortium. Um, so in phase one, the HMM SAG, and then in phase two, Chrome HMM and Segway. And these are general methods that allow you to use unsupervised learning, in a, usually in a hidden Markov model or a dynamic Bayesian network, and take into account many different kinds of genomic assays uh, to try to annotate the genome. So uh, sort of conceptually, the idea is in this particular case, you've got three different assays that are measured along the whole genome, and you use an unsupervised method to automatically segment the genome and assign labels to each of the segments in such a way that every, every segment that has the same label exhibits similar properties in the data. And it's called semi-automated because all that you get is sort of arbitrary integers assigned to each of these kinds of segments. And then a human has to come along and say, oh, look, number two looks like it's an exon in this particular case. Okay, so this is a, a widely used uh, kind of procedure. And our question was, couldn't we do this to try to assign larger scale things? Rather than looking at enhancers and promoters and so on, could we try to identify large scale domain level um, activity in the, in the genome or inactivity in the genome? Okay, so this, is, this seems intuitively appealing, but there's one immediate problem, which is that the high c data is not, it doesn't fit with all the others, right? One of these things is not like the others. These are all essentially vectors of length 3 billion, right, along the genome. This is a matrix, right? And now, all of a sudden, all of the great tools that we have to do the semi-automated genome annotation break down. Right? The whole point of a hidden Markov model, or more generally a dynamic Bayesian network, is that you have efficient algorithms that exploit the Markov property. And you can make them work quickly because the, the, the sequence of data is laid out along the genome linearly. The contact map just messes that up entirely. So what we would like to be able to do instead is to say, how can we train one of these SAGA methods, these semi-automated genome annotation methods, while taking into account the high c data. And in particular, at the domain scale, it's, it's reasonable to think that if two regions of the genome are, are in a, have strong contacts according to the high c data, then we might want to assign them the same label. If they're both in, both in the same compartment in 3D, then they probably are both repressive or not repressive and so on. So that's our, our goal, is to try to figure out some way to do that. Um, and what we do is essentially take the original data and we lay on top of it this pairwise graph 
which it represents essentially the contact matrix, right? This is just another representation of the same thing. Now the trick is if you just use that graph directly and put edges into your dynamic Bayesian network, you'll never be able to do the computation. So the question is, how are we going to do this? If we add the edges directly, we can either add, do approximate inference um, and then, or we can just try to do the compute and never have it finish. And furthermore, it's not totally clear what, the, what sort of generative process would correspond to these kinds of edges. And so instead, what we decided was, let's pose this as a kind of a prior, or more formally, as a posterior regularization. So I'm not going to go into all the details of the machine learning methods that, that make this happen. There's a separate paper in a machine learning conference on the actual algorithm to do it. But the basic idea is that you have your typical term, which is just the usual expectation maximization stuff that you do for training one of these models, and then you add in an additional regularizer that assort, essentially encourages the labels for one position and another position to be the same if they have strong links in the high C data. Okay, so uh, the method is called entropic graph-based regularization, and essentially you have an edge weight here where that edge weight is coming from the high C data. Okay, so we first wanted to show that this works in theory before we showed that it works in practice, so we did a simulation. We generated data according to a very simple hidden Markov model, but then we uh, imposed this additional constraint during the simulation so that the labels had strong probabilities of being similar according to some graph. And then we did a, very, a, a variety of different methods and just measured our error at reconstructing the label set. Um, so the first two are just standard inference methods, either inferring everything co totally independently or assuming a Markov chain. Loopy belief propagation is a standard method for doing approximate inference. Uh, and then there's our method, EGPR, this entropic graph-based posterior regularization, and then also one that uses a squared error. I didn't mention it before, but the EGPR is using Kolbeck-Leibler divergence, which is a particular way of penalizing. So this is just showing that compared to all those methods in simulation, this works really well. We then went on to look at real data, and one of the things that we thought we would exploit is the fact that it's becoming more and more obvious how correlated high C data is with um, replication timing data. So the idea here is that you have um, an annotation that you might uh, come up with independently, not using replication timing, uh, and then you measure how well this annotation sort of correlates with the replication timing, essentially by taking out the, the variance that's due to the replication or to the annotation and then looking at the residual variance in the replication timing data. Um, so this gave us a way to sort of measure how well we were doing. This is the average relative standard deviation explained. So it's essentially um, a, higher, a higher value here is better. And what we've, we're comparing is different regularization strengths. So if we look at the left side here, this is where we're just running our classical method, the segue method that we had previously developed for doing uh, semi-automated genome annotation, ignoring the high C data entirely. And then if we really crank up the regularizer, that means we're essentially only looking at the high C data and ignoring all of the other histone modification and so on kinds of data that go into the, into the annotation method. And what you see is that the, the best performance in terms of correlation with this replication timing is, is an intermediate value there. So then we went on to try to use this method to make sense of what's going on in, uh, in the genome. So we looked in particular at IMR90, which is one of the ENCODE cell types. Uh, we had 30 different data types, including a bunch of histone modifications, some important transcription factors, DNA accessibility, and so on. Um, and we came up with a model uh, that, that used the high c data as well to say that there are essentially five different types of uh, domains um, in, in the human genome. Um, most of these are, we're going to be familiar to most of you, so you have regions where not much is going on at all. You have the constitutive and facultative heterochromatin, and then you have specific and broad uh, regions of expression. So let me just tell you a little more about each of these. So as the names would suggest, if you go and look at, say, gene annotations, the regions that are marked with, by the model as constitutive uh, heterochromatin or that are totally quiescent have very few genes in them. So this is the genes per megabase for each of these kinds of regions. 
Um, on the other hand, if you look at facultative heterochromatin, it isn't depleted for genes. So this is the mean across the genome for how many genes per megabase. And it's just about average for the number of genes per megabase. But this is a repressed region. And so you, if you look at the uh, difference from the mean of the expression within this, these regions, actually facultative heterochromatin, because it's so repressed, has a much lower expression even than the, the constitutive or the quiescent uh, regions. Then we have the broad and the um, specific expression domains. And for both of these, you see an enrichment for expression. So these are, are basically regions where uh, you've got uh, lots of genes turned on. Um, however, what we look, if we look at many different cell types, we see that the broad domains show activity in all cell types, while the specific expression domains sort of switch activity. So the model is like this, where you might have it on in IMR90 and off in other cell types, whereas broad is on everywhere. And this is just data showing this, where you have the fraction of active genes that are specifically expressed in the IMR90 cell type. So um, this is something that had been observed previously in Drosophila. These same kinds of, of categorizations occur in Drosophila. And this is just showing that we could automatically identify the same phenomenon in the human genome. We then went on to look at doing domain annotations across many different cell types. So this is eight different cell types. Um, they're listed here. They're, uh, they're all ENCODE cell types where we had lots of different histone modifications. So in this case, we're looking at 12 different histone modifications per cell type, and we're coming up with an annotation that's using seg Segway, our original method, plus the high C data. Um, and what we see is a fair amount of consistency across the cell types. So you have uh, a lot of, so each of these rows corresponds to one cell type, and the five different colors here correspond to those five different kinds of domains I talked to you about. Uh, and what the vertical bars, the do vertical dash bars here, correspond to boundaries that are consistent across all or most of those cell types. And then you have some other cell type specific boundaries um, along, the, along the genome as well. In particular, we noticed that the developmentally consistent domain boundaries, the ones that, that were dotted vertical lines in the previous graph, are uh, particularly en enriched for promoters and CTCF sites. And this is also consistent with what's been shown elsewhere in the literature. And so this suggests a model where you have uh, domains that are composed of co-regulated units, where you, have, you may have uh, some of the consistent domain boundaries, but also the smaller domains within them that, the, that may be apparent only in one cell type and not in, in all cell types. So uh, that's the story about two different genomes and how they, uh, they uh, bend in three dimensions and, and relate to gene expression. And I'm sure there's going to be a lot more similar stories coming out in the years to come. So I'm happy to take questions. Thanks. Hi, Bill. Uh, beautiful, beautiful work. Uh, I have a couple of questions. So the first one is uh, just a comment on the K36 trimethylation association with these um, sort of selective uh, the specific uh, domains? Uh, no, no, in, in your very first talk, yeah, the specific domains that are basically evading the host by expressing only one of something like oh, 60. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So in uh, olfactory neurons, uh, as well as in repressed genes and all kinds of things, there's, there's similar <clears throat> ways of actually selecting only one of many. And K36 trimethylation is one of the marks. Um, it's 4K20 monomethylation is another mark. So it's this... Um, uh, yeah, cap but, one repressed domain. So I'm just curious if K36 is only one component of the story, it's a, and it's, it's a, actually cap one domain. Yeah, no, it's actually a quite different mechanism apparently than the olfactory genes. I don't know the full details of the olfactory genes, but I've, I, you know, I sort of came across that also. Someone else mentioned it earlier, and I went yeah. and looked into it, and then talked to Karine, who's the expert in this thing. And and there is there actually was a Nature paper published maybe two years ago now where they've they've figured out a lot more about what the particular protein is that's responsible for shuttling these things cool. uh, around the, the virulence genes. And so it seems to be really a completely different uh, mechanism, than the, even though it's a similar phenomenon to the Thank olfactory you. genes. Uh, so the second question is about the uh, constraint that you're imposing based on three-dimensional data to actually have the same information. I'm just curious whether your model would allow you mean the same label the same label yeah, yeah. i'm curious whether your model would allow pairs of complementary quote unquote labels 
to be often put together. For example, enhancer promoter interactions, you don't want them to have the same label, but you want them to co-occur quite often. So I'm just wondering if your model would actually allow that and if that's an easy modification to what you already have or whether you would need to re-engineer everything. Yeah, that would make it apply at a finer scale, wouldn't it? I'm not, it's not immediately obvious to me how you would modify it to do that. Um, you need to have some measure of sort of label similarity, right? So it re requires that you have some something more than just a discrete label space. I mean, I, on the face of it, it strikes me as potentially feasible. You just have to figure out how to de define that space. Um, but I'd be interested in talking Fabulous. more about And then the last one is, I was quite struck that the expression differences between the specific and the broad in the other cell, or at least in, in, in their specificity, was actually so small. So I'm just curious what, what that could be due to. So it was, um, yeah, so th that big arrow, um, I think in the next slide, the, the big arrow, yeah, the big red arrow. So you're basically saying what's the fraction of active genes and you basically go from, I mean, it's sort of, you know, hovering around this. Like 10% uh, to 20%, yeah. I mean, it's a, almost a factor of two, but you're right. I mean, I guess. Uh, were you, sur I mean, what was your expectation? I'm just curious if somehow, maybe allowing for more domains uh, than five might actually show larger differences and maybe you're lumping multiple states together and that's what's leading to this, I mean, what I perceive as relatively small difference. Yeah, I, I suppose that's possible. I, you know, the, obviously, as you know, as you well know, choosing the number of labels <laughs> has a certain <clears throat> amount of black yeah. art to it, right? So um, this gave us a, a, an interpretive, a, an interpretable model that, you know, few would, um, object to but i think you're probably right there's a lot more yeah. if you allow more i'd labels. be curious if you run it with seven if you'd find stronger differences or something yeah. like that yeah, we should thank you that. beautiful work thanks yeah great talk bill um i had, i'm shocked that there are no more there are still questions to ask after manolis <laughs> 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 but i still have a couple well there were other um, people they one all was like. a clarification one <laughs> yeah i'm sure there's people have disappeared um <laughs> The, you, back used, there. you used the uh, high C as a prior, you said, yeah. and then um, you showed some results where, you know, you said you get the same consistent answers across cell types. And so one question is, you know, are you sort of right. gaming it that way? And then, um, well, I'll let you answer that one. So first. that's a good question. So the, we didn't have uh, high C for all those cell types. And so what we did was we created a single aggregate high C graph from the, the cell types that we did have it for. And so you're right, it's not that surprising that there's going to be some consistency because you're using the same prior uh, for all of them. Uh, the other one was an observation of one of your results, and that is, and I, I was hoping you could comment on it, uh, you showed when you messed around with the, the, pr the parameter uh -huh. that um, when you just use high C, you actually improved over Segway. So can you, that, that, that kind of surprised me that well, you could ignore all the other, um, his, uh, the, all the marks from the histones and just use the high C and get higher accuracy and annotation, is that? Well, high C data is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I, yeah, I, I, a priori, I wouldn't have one necessarily one, uh, I, I wasn't clear to me which of those would be better. Um, you know, there is a, a heck of a lot of information in the, in the high C data about this kind of phenomenon. On the other hand, it's hard to, I wouldn't draw too much from that because the, on the left, it's a method designed to work from those kind of data. On the right, it's kind of a weird thing, right? We're just, I, I don't even really know when we crank up the regularization, what that consists of. So it, to address that more, we'd have to go and test that more specifically, I think. Yeah. Can you comment, um, maybe speculate on the connection between Plasmodium using 3D architecture to regulate gene expression and maybe... Wait, I missed some words. Plasmodium, plasmodium uses 3D conformation or 3D kind of chrom chromosome conformation to regulate expression. Um, and, and maybe it's life cycle or maybe it's high AT content or something like that. Do you, what, what makes Plasmodium special? Okay. Uh, well, I can try. I mean, I think that... It, that on the one, one thing is simply that evolution comes up with a lot of weird stuff, right? And so if you look around, there's no reason to think that we're going to, the, the solution that we came up with, which involves these uh, topological domains or contact domains, whatever you want to call them, being replicated in certain ways, would be the same elsewhere. I think what happened is, you know, you look at something like yeast, 
Yeast is essentially like a big open chromatin domain, right? And there's really not that much relationship to gene expression except insofar as, you know, there is some, some of this centromere clustering because of the tethering to the spindle pole body and so on. And I think plasmodium was probably driven by, you know, needing to evade the, the host immune system to come up with some way to, to control its genes more. And it didn't happen to come up with our particular mechanisms. It said, there's this other thing I can do where it has the histone marks and it's getting these guys shuttled down to one end and, and um, that presumably, uh, I don't know, that's not a very satisfying answer, but it seems like it's just uh, essentially evolution being creative, taking different pathways. That's how I interpret it. Not what you were thinking. But. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I could tell. Uh, yeah, so just following up, so does plasmidium uh, genome looks more like yeast or like humans in terms of... Oh, I'm of sorry, I should, have, I should have made that clear. Way more like yeast. So plasmodium is haploid and, it, um, and it's like 23 million bases, whereas yeast is like 16 or maybe it's the other way around, but that it's a very yeast-like, which is partly why we, we were looking at it as a place to start. Also in terms of non-coding regions and... So the non-coding regions are approximately Plice, the same in terms yeah. of density. Yeah. Same as yeast. As yeast, that's okay. right. So you don't have these big intergenic regions. Sorry, just a technical question and um, forgive my ignorance. How do you, uh, um, what's the gold standard for the replication timing? So it's not a gold standard, it's derived. What we're doing is inferring an annotation from histone modification and then using the replication timing as a kind of pseudo gold standard. So we're asking how well do we, does our annotation from the histone mods explain the variance that we observe in the replication timing data. Thanks. Anybody else? Good. Thank right, you. So for an appreciation. <laughs>